So my notifications have been blowing up all week. Um, I, I don't want to say that I'm like the talking mushroom guy, but I certainly have um, popularized the idea that mushrooms are talking. And recently, a study by Andrew Adamatsky, butchering it. Anyways, Andrew Adamatsky um, recently came out talking about mushrooms talking. Now, I've been aware of Andrew's work since 2018. A paper came out in which he was looking at the spiking behavior of the pink oyster mushroom, and he basically identified that the pink oyster mushroom was um, was giving off these, these electrical voltage spikes in what he was describing as spike trains. To measure electrical activity of fungi, uh, we insert electrodes into the substrate. And electrodes, in turn, are connected to amplifier and uh, analog digital converter, which in turn is connected to the laptop. Uh, now, recently, he just did a study where he started to analyze those spike trains, and he found by analyzing them linguistically using computer science that there may be a language consisting of up to 50 words. We have eight differential channels. So basically, we insert uh, eight pairs of differential electrodes and measure potential difference between uh, each electrode in the pair. For example, in this pair inserted in the uh, oyster colonized substrate, we measure potential difference between uh, white and red electrodes. Now this is really exciting for me because I've always sort of imagined the communication signals being sent out by the mushrooms as kind of like, you know, sort of the communication signals that one would have between like their brain and their hands or something. but we're starting to see that they might be language. And if we look at some other work by other mycologists, we start to see that individual hi-fi, or hi-fa, hi-fi, I'm terrible at pronouncing these words because I just read them mostly, um, might have as much more autonomy than, than cells in our own body. And what I mean by that is that the individual hi-fi are able to seek out and find uh, nutrients by themselves, where like a cell in my finger can't find nutrients by itself. It relies on my entire body, my entire organism to do that. Um, and then similarly, they, they, there's some evidence that mushrooms may have memory even on the individual hi-fi level. Um, and, and what those are, those are the little individual cells that make up the mycelium. Um, and so what we're seeing is that individual cells of mushrooms have more autonomy than individual cells of animals and humans, um, and that they might actually be sending uh, not just communication signals, but actual language to each other, which is, is very... Uh, this, that's an exciting thing. Um, so I got in touch with Andrew Adamatsky, and he was kind enough to send me uh, some of his research uh, and some videos and stuff. So we'll, we'll take a look at some of his content real quick. Um, and yeah, thank you all for tuning in. And obviously, we'll, we'll check out the, this reishi mushroom talking too. So when eight pairs of differential electrodes are inserted into the substrate, Electrical activity is measured, and uh, we can see it ported on the computer screen. I found that mushrooms actually spike. They produce the same action potential like impulses as neurons do. And the impulses, as you can see on the plot on the right, have very pronounced depolarization phase, a repolarization phase, and refractory period. Trains of spikes could be different. On the plot, you can see on the left, a relatively high frequency, high in terms of mushrooms, oscillations. It's period about uh, two hours. And uh, relatively low frequency oscillations or spiking, where distance between spikes is about five hours. So high frequency shown on the left insert and uh, low frequency on the right insert. So mushrooms do spike, as neurons do. Would mushrooms change their electrical activity if we stimulate them optically or physically? To test, we use so-called fungal laser produced by our partner Smogu. It's thin layer of mycelium, which remind laser by texture and actually overall looks. We inserted electrodes in this fungal laser and applied weight about 450 gram. We found that when weight is applied, then mycelium 
response with a large pronounced spike as you can see on the first example w star followed by a series of smaller high frequency spikes one weight is removed again we have like larger spike response and series of smaller spikes but in amplitude they are a bit less a bit smaller than those producing the response for the application of the load. Yeah, so Andrew Adamaski goes on to talk about how he was able to detect various responses in mushrooms uh, to, to touch stimulus, to light stimulus, um, and then talks about like some of the really interesting practical applications for mushrooms, ways, things that we haven't really considered before, like mushroom as a material, like to make fake leathers or building materials, packing materials is something that we've heard about a lot. But uh, Adamansky is is exploring some of the ideas of using mycelium as a computer to do mushroom computing, which would be like pretty crazy if we could figure out how to like grow a computer. And also they've been doing some research on using mushroom wearables um, because the mushrooms can detect when they're touched, um, using those to, to create some sort of technology, some sort of sensing technology. So this stuff is really at the forefront of mushroom research, mushroom technology, and it's super exciting to see and super exciting to see that it's gained so much uh, popularity and traction in the media. So not only are mushrooms potentially talking, but also there might be some more applications of how we can use mushrooms that we hadn't considered before. So let's finish this off with uh, my piece of, of, uh, of reishi music here. Uh, now, what I do is, is it, yeah, the reishi's talking and we're maybe picking up some of those electrical spikes. We're pretty much primarily looking at the galvanic response, which is going to have a lot of information of like water transport and things like that. And then obviously it's being translated by the synthesizer, which is made for making art. What I do is purely for art. What Andrew Adamansky does is is real science. Um, and we've actually talked a little bit about potentially me gathering some data for him because I would love to get my hands wet in some real science and not just making art. But that, that said, I'm an artist. I majored in art in college and then worked for a synthesizer company for a while. Uh, so without further ado, let's watch some of my art and let's go. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 